Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Ashish Tayama and I am your Nokia moderator for today's Nokia Adventure virtual event. We're doing something new and more interactive than your typical webinar and going live with presentations and demos for the topic of Nokia 5G and future of telemedicine. Before we get started, I would like to go over a bit of housekeeping. This event is being recorded. At any time during the presentation, you may enter a question by clicking on Ask button. Your questions will be addressed at the end of the session. And with that, I am going to now introduce Mike Kinevi. Mike Kinevi is head of Global 5G R&D at Nokia. Nokia is a global R&D company and our customers such as AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile support more than 6.4 billion subscriptions with our radio networks. By subscriptions, think your mobile phone or the Internet of Things. Also, our enterprise customers have deployed over 1,300 industrial networks worldwide. Nokia's mission is to create the technology to connect the world. Our Chicago Innovation Center was founded by Bell Labs in Naperville, Illinois in the year 1966. This site was then acquired by Nokia in 2016. Our site consists of 1,400 plus employees, of which greater than 95% are R&D. Our people and the diversity of our people are our greatest asset. Many of Nokia's products and technology portfolios have been invented and driven out of our Naperville site. We have end-to-end -end hardware and software product development capability. In addition, we have a strong focus in relationship with our U.S. customers. We have delivered all generations of cellular technologies with a current focus on 4G and 5G. In fact, Nokia Bell Labs is now leading the way on 6G. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are transforming our portfolios as we speak. Understanding that our current 5G systems that are being deployed globally will enable many new use cases such as telemedicine, augmented reality, virtual reality, just to name a few. We are investing, partnering, and continuing to expand our 5G portfolio. And now back to you, Ashish. Thanks, Mike. I would now like to introduce Marcus Weldon, our Corporate Chief Technology Officer and President of Nokia Bell Labs. Hello everyone, I'm Marcus Weldon. I'm the Corporate Chief Technology Officer of Nokia and the President of Bell Labs. I want to talk to you today about how we see the future and it's informed by a number of very recent circumstances and catalysts of which COVID-19 is one, but there are some technology catalysts as well. And what we're beginning to see is a future where everything is remote, but we obviously need to be able to accomplish real human tasks, real productivity tasks in a remote way as if we were there. So that's what we call remote X, and we see it as a new human era and also the future of a new era of value creation and productivity. So without any further ado, let's get into uh, how we see that. So one of the things I want to start by highlighting is that productivity is a very important topic. It may seem a little bit mundane and just a term of uh, economists. But in fact, it's probably what most human endeavor is all about is increasing the, the rate at which we do things or produce things or travel to somewhere. All of that is productivity enhancing because it allows us to be more efficient in the lives we lead both uh, at home and at work. So I'm going to argue that productivity is a human driver, not just an economic driver. And you can see that uh, this data from Robert Gordon's book showed that productivity growth went up uh, dramatically in the first and second industrial revolutions. But as we entered the internet age or the so-called third industrial revolution, you can see that productivity growth has dropped. And that's of course alarming because if productivity is as important as Paul Krugman says, that it's the fundamentals of, of most of what human endeavor uh, seeks to achieve, then the growth rate of productivity dropping needs to be addressed. And so we're going to look at that and show that uh, perhaps this new era, this era of remoting control and interaction 
and connectivity to all our systems and uh, and uh, entities and robotics and and uh, people and buildings. Maybe this era of remoting uh, ourselves from those actually is productivity enhancing if we build those systems in the right way. And one of the key themes, of course, in this day and age is healthcare. So we're going to focus on that later in this series of presentations. And you'll hear from Anne and Michael and Sean about some very interesting work we're doing in the idea of uh, remote healthcare. But let's move ahead with the general concept of remoting things and how it enhances productivity. So I want to first take a, a look at the internet age, that problematic age where productivity growth has been dropping. And if you divide it into decades, you can see that uh, it's, it's not a monotonic age. It's had, it's had structure where each decade has been a little bit different. It started with supercomputing then moved to being dominated by personal computing. Both of those were enterprise productivity enhancing. Supercomputers allowed, it, allowed build, uh, businesses to compute complex uh, mathematical problems and physical world problems uh, and more efficiently. And uh, personal computing allowed more of enterprise tasks, particularly communications tasks and productivity tasks, creating documents and, uh, and text and, and images. So, so those were enterprise dominated uh, decades. And then in parallel, we had the mobile communications revolution, roughly around the late 1990s to 2000s, which was uh, initially also an enterprise dominated transition where people needed to communicate uh, for business purposes uh, anywhere, anytime. And that, that was the communications uh, revolution around about uh, the 2000s. And in fact, what you see then happened was that the merging of the computing revolution and the communications revolution, and in the 2010 era, the sort of smartphone era, that's really what uh, Apple and others invented was mobile computing. We think of it as a, we call it a smartphone, but in fact, it's a smart mobile computer. And so there was a merging of those two things, and that's the value paradigm we've been living through. But in fact, that's been consumer-led. It came from a different aspect than the previous generations and actually came from the consumer side of things. It was very consumerist in its look and feel and its interactivity. So we've been living through uh, an age which has been an anomaly, I would argue, where consumer-led uh, trends and, and habits and needs were, were what dominated. And that's really what I'm gonna argue has led to this stalling in productivity growth. And we're going to change that in the, in the coming era because there's a more important problem to focus on than this, which is what consumers have ended up doing. It's shopping, as we all know, and that was very useful in the COVID-19 era. It's, of course, access to entertainment, also useful during lockdowns and COVID-19 restrictions. A bit of e-commerce and business and banking uh, as well. But mostly we entertained ourselves and we spent money. But that's not the root of productivity. It may be utility. It helps with utility and it's convenient, but it doesn't actually increase productivity. So what is going to happen if we look forward is this a new augmented human age that helps us with the productivity tasks I talked about. Uh, and a lot of those will be uh, now done in a remote way. So what does that mean? It means a new value system. If you look at the value stack I show here, what we need to enable that we haven't enabled to date is augmented intelligent systems. Think of those as AI systems to help humans perform tasks more efficiently. Those tasks will be Think of them as augmented human tasks. So think of you could have augmented information sent to you either in goggles or a headset or through whatever means, through a screen. Uh, and, and then you'll, that information will be relevant and contextual to the task you're performing anywhere, anytime. And that's how we get to the idea of remote tech. So we'll be able to remotely diagnose you, remotely operate on you using whatever tools are locally available to you, maybe even command a robotic system to come to you in the most advanced version of that and be able to do that from anywhere, anytime. So, of course, that's almost perfect because the specialist can be in contact with the patient uh, and helping the patient, not just monitoring, but actually curing, fixing, operating on the patient as well. So that's that new reality that we're about to enter. And we're about to enter it because a number of things have come together, the COVID-19 imperative, but also the tech enablers are there, as well as perhaps the business imperative. Businesses need to operate in this way as well because it's more efficient. So really what we're arguing is that uh, this 5G era, 
because, and we call it the 5G era because 5G networks will be at the core of this. One of the gaps up till now has been networks and mobile networks in particular haven't been able to, to uh, allow such levels of low latency, high performance connectivity. So, but in the 5G era, that's possible. So it's, the 5G era really is about three big things, virtual private edge cloud networks, and I'll explain that in a bit, uh, AI augmentation systems that help humans perform tasks by helping us understand what needs to be done. And then we need to connect to data coming from our physical world, from different sensors, but also a set of machines and tools that allow us to impact or interact with our physical world remotely and enhance our abilities. So those are the three big things we're talking about. And of course, those are not the end state. We actually even have a view of 6G. And in 6G, it is those same things, but will be deeply embedding the biological piece of the equation. So it'll be physical, digital, and biological in perfect harmony, but that's a topic for another time. So let's move ahead with uh, some of the thinking here so you understand the logic of, uh, of this need for AI systems. And these AI systems have to run in the cloud because they have to know everything. So this chart here is uh, a version of a curve called the Buckminster Fuller knowledge doubling curve. And it was a piece of work done uh, by Buckminster Fuller, the polymath, who indicated that knowledge doubles in uh, an increasingly fast rate. So in fact, every half period the, of time, the knowledge has doubled. So it's a very powerful law. It, initially, he looked at a 500 year period, then 250 year, then 125. And each period, the knowledge doubled. So the, the extrapolation of that done by uh, IBM was that knowledge, or at least data, would double every 12 hours in 2020, and it is probably true. And of course, that's before the massive onboarding of IoT devices, which are going to send status information about everything from every physical entity in our physical world in general uh, all the time. So uh, we're at the point where the amount of data being generated might be doubling every hour very soon. And of course, that's impossible for a human to operate on. And here's why. Humans are, are well known in their learning behaviors. There's a, a study by uh, uh, Ebbinghaus that uh, he plotted a forgetting curve. And this is how well you retain information after learning it. And you can see that after 15 to 20 days, humans generally retain about only 10% of what they've learned. And that's uh, that's of steady state information. Of course, if that information is changing constantly, it's even harder to remember. So we have an impossible problem. Data is going to be deluging upon us, or overwhelming us, uh, that we need to act upon in order to perform a task that we are remote from, uh, and we need help. And that's really where the idea of AI systems operating in edge cloud networks. So it's both the edge cloud, because I need low latency and, and high performance cloud, higher performance and lower latency that I can get from the regular centralized cloud, but I need a network with a very high performance that attaches to those remote things, those remote sensors and machines. So that's the equation for the future that I talked about. And it's all to solve this problem. So if we move ahead, I want to highlight how COVID-19 has been a catalyst. And uh, it's, it's quite obvious when you look at what we've learned in the COVID-19 uh, year so far is that remote video communications of high quality and so far, we're just using it for person to person, but imagine it's person to machine and person to system. It's got to be increasingly high quality, multi-dimensional uh, communication systems that allow us to interact from anywhere, anytime. Uh, actually, networks came to the fore. Uh, it wasn't just mobile networks, which we relied on, but fixed networks, the idea of actually having very high performance uh, connectivity to your home. And then of course it's wireless inside the home and, and then out and about is, is mobile wireless. Uh, that became clear was a fundamental part of any new way of living. Streaming platforms. This is a precursor to AR in general or virtual reality in general that will allow us to understand our world. Right now, we just entertained ourselves, but going forward, the streaming of data and images and digital twins will become the new reality so we can perceive our world completely. The idea of tracking. I think we never thought we would need to know where everything is with such precision. I think we all now understand the human need uh, due to do contact tracing. But in fact, it's it's a general problem of knowing where all your assets are. Those are people assets and machines and sensors and, 
and systems, you need to be able to collect those together in real time to uh, operate on them uh, and, and uh, with highest uh, efficiency and productivity. And then, of course, securing that. If we're putting all these things together, these pieces together in new ways, if we worried about security in certain video conferencing systems uh, during the, the COVID age, now imagine our physical world and all our assets are online. It's got to be massively secure. And of course, I come back to the idea of healthcare. Healthcare needs all these things, a wealth of data being transported to an expert system and person that can perceive the whole problem, perhaps with a new perception tool, uh, and then send instructions back to a remote system that operates on the patient. Imagine if that wasn't secure. Imagine if that was exposed to others uh, uh, in an unwitting fashion. So security is at the heart of all of this. And this is our remote X paradigm in the talk title. Remote X is where we see the new value being created, not just for healthcare, but for all systems. So why now? And what's the role of 5G? Well, I explained that most human tasks and the seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, we do in about 100 milliseconds. So we've built networks that are capable of, of having a latency of 100 milliseconds, which is quite good, uh, but it's not good enough for any of these tasks I've been talking about. Now here I show an assembly line, but equally I could have shown a hospital uh, attaching to a, a remote uh, expert and a remote patient. The key part is if I want to wirelessly connect a, a, a set of systems that are moving in real time, I need the numbers on the right. I need very high availability. The system can't go down when it's in the middle of operating on you. It can't stall or, or, or deviate from its path. So I need very high availability. I need very low latency. Latency is precision. When I'm moving something, uh, the time control I have equals the is the distance control I have. So it's very important. I'm very precise in many of these tasks. Uh, and of course, I, latency is about interactivity with the expert as well. I need the expert to be able to see actually what's going on and not what was happening uh, 100 milliseconds ago. Otherwise, they'll be making a mistake. And then, of course, there are lots of other parameters that I won't talk about, but it's it's massive numbers of things in a small area need to be supported with low latency and high availability. The nice part is that this is also human enhancing. There's two things we do much faster uh, than 100 milliseconds. We can touch if touch perception in, in a few tens of milliseconds. And in a headset, when we move our heads, we have a few tens of milliseconds of latency there. So in fact, humans will be able to benefit, not just machines. And in fact, you can argue that humans and machines will be in perfect harmony because uh, we'll be able to fully use our sensory capabilities to interact with and control uh, machines and also interact uh, with other humans uh, in real time. So that's the new paradigm. So in essence, what our point is on the networking side, which I'm just gonna highlight here, is we've built wireless networks uh, based on LTE technology, which were capable of mostly pretty reasonable capacity for web browsing, media, entertainment, et cetera, as I talked about. But the 5G world uh, increases that capacity, but also adds reliability and latency. And here's the change. If you look at this, the numbers uh, we were able to achieve on going from LTE to 5G are orders of magnitude better. I can massively increase the capacity if you look at the white numbers going to the blue numbers, massively in increase the reliability and decrease the latency. So 5G is the catalyst, a fundamental enabler of this remote X revolution. And I want to leave you with this thought. It's back to my productivity point. If we look at what did happen in the COVID-19 era so far, that's the data in blue on the left. Uh, this is a study of the e-commerce platform growth or transaction growth during the three first months of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And you saw that it, those, uh, those platforms achieved what uh, was considered 10 years worth of growth in use in just three months because they were already in place being used uh, or for a variety of cloud processing systems, but they could scale out immediately to achieve uh, an order of magnitude growth uh, almost in uh, in three months. Phenomenal performance, and it allowed us to survive the initial era. But what we weren't able to do was interact with our physical world, and that's the physical part of the the uh, the plot on the on the right. This yellow part says where we need to go in future. It's not just about e-commerce, which is remote shopping and remote entertainment. It's about remote X, remote everything, including healthcare. And so we see the beginning of this era uh, happening now with 5G deployments beginning, and it'll continue through the 6G era 
that I mentioned. And what you'll see is all of our physical systems, and I've mentioned them, uh, transportation systems, machine systems, mining systems, energy systems, logistics systems, and healthcare systems will all suddenly become as digitized as uh, the e-commerce world that we've uh, we've been benefiting from so far. There will be leaders, of course, and there'll be laggards, but this age is nearly upon us. And you're going to see that in the presentations following me from Sean and, and Michael and Anne. So in summary, just to wrap up my introduction is, I think we all know we have a new remote normal that we're living through and we're likely to live through for the foreseeable future, not just because it's imposed on us, but because it's easier to live that way, as long as we can have resonant interactions with humans and systems and our physical world. If we could achieve that in the right way, then it's, it's highly efficient and it's sustainable and energy conserving and time conserving. So it's a very efficient way to live if we can complete the equation. So it's a new human era of, of existence uh, and it's based on some new value systems that I've, I've highlighted today. And what I'd like to say in conclusion is, it's also, I would argue, a new beginning for humankind. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marcus. I would now like to introduce Anne Lee, our CTO partner from Nokia Bell Labs, and Sean Kennedy, our head of algorithms, analytics, augmented intelligence, and devices lab. Anne and Sean will give insights on societal transformation through connectivity technologies in the era of COVID-19. For many years, leaders and experts have been warning about the coming of a major pandemic. With the exploding human population taking over more and more sparsely inhabited land like the rainforest and climate change melting the ice caps, unknown viruses and bacteria are being released with unpredictable consequences. Connectivity technologies can help to transform society to first cope and then thrive even in the midst of a pandemic like COVID-19. At Nokia, we call the results of this societal transformation the Remote X world. In the Remote X world, healthcare will get help. Help to not just enable a patient to see a doctor in a video call, but for the doctor to examine the patient remotely. Help to continuously monitor a patient's health and predict probable illness. Help to improve treatment. Help to get to personalized medicine. And help to recognize epidemiological trends. COVID-19 is top of mind for most people in America. We are now entering the winter season and leading doctors are warning us that the next few weeks will be the darkest of the entire pandemic. It's in this context that we will be witnessing continuing societal transformations through connectivity technologies, some of which will become permanent. Healthcare has been going digital for decades, but for a myriad of reasons, telehealth had not taken off, not until this year. Frost and Sullivan now forecast a seven-fold tsunami of growth. Why the sudden change? Well, in order to quickly enable virtual visits this year, the U.S. government has relaxed its HIPAA compliance regulations for telehealth apps. And both Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurance companies have expanded their coverage to pay for telehealth. These actions have spurred companies to start innovating and reimagining new approaches to providing health care. And these actions have facilitated a dramatic rise in virtual visits. Leaders in healthcare, including the head of the Center for Medicare and Medicare S Medicaid Services, has said that they cannot imagine ever going back to the days without telehealth. Looking forward to post pandemic, we see trends that point to the need to make telehealth permanent. One major trend is a transitioning of 77 million baby boomers into their senior years. 10 years from now, all of them will be over the age of 65. Seniors tend to need more frequent visits to the doctors than the general population. And they're also the ones who have the most issues physically moving around. Virtual visits could go a long way in ensuring that seniors will get all the care that they need, whether it's from a doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a therapist while at home or in an assisted living facility. Virtual visits could also be invaluable in rural areas with chronic shortages of healthcare workers for all patients and not just seniors. Closing the digital divide, which leads us to the introduction of Nokia's hyper e healthcare vision. 
The Nokia Hyper-E Healthcare Vision encompasses three main technology components. The first is sensing, providing the technology to sense health issues through artificial intelligence. To enable sensing, the second component of persistent monitoring technology is needed. This includes medical device sensors and collection of data from these sensors into secure and private personal health records. The third component is the technology to enable virtual visits with the doctor that closely mimics or even exceeds the effectiveness of an in-person visit with the doctor. Current technology only takes us so far. There is a gap between these connection technologies that enable remote interactions and the intimate connections that we need as humans to th thrive. In building these connections, we need to build a mach machines driven by artificial intelligence that are more human-like than ever before. Machines that leverage the unbelievable capabilities that modern artificial intelligence has given us. Machines that mimic human medical professionals and their ability to solve complex problems. In doing so, we turn to the work of Daniel Kahneman, who suggested that human thinking can be described in terms of two systems. The first system, system one, is responsible for unconscious, fast, automatic, everyday decisions, such as when a doctor walks into a room and immediately knows that a patient is getting better. System one is an incredibly powerful tool at our disposal and is extremely efficient, but is error prone and full of biases. Much of Kahneman's work is about the systematic and predictable errors that occur with system one type thinking. The second system, system two, is responsible for conscious, slow, complex decision making, such as when a doctor needs to make a difficult diagnosis. System two additionally acts as a checker on system one, continually asking the question, is this answer good enough? Even though system two is capable of re reliably solving complex challenges, it is effortful to use and much slower than the automatic system one. Separately, these systems are flawed, but together they become the powerful tool of human cognition. I believe the future of artificial intelligence is in building these systems. Because remote healthcare will necessarily be driven by AI, the future of healthcare is therefore building these more human systems. The two system architecture gives us a path forward that leverages existing technologies while pointing out the directions that we need to head to tackle the complex problems of the world today. For example, System 1 AIs will be used for constantly monitoring patients via the sensing devices in their environment. These tools will be efficient and quick, but subject to errors. System 2 AIs will continually ask, is this good enough? Provide deeper insights and more complex decision-making when needed. System that solve these problems will be the backbone of any future healthcare solution. Thank you. Thanks, Anne and Sean. I would now like to introduce Michael Eggleston, who leads the data and devices group at Bell Labs. Michael will give insights on next generation non-invasive health sensing. We now rely on our globally spanning telecommunication network for almost every aspect of our lives, from how we work, to how we communicate with our loved ones, to how we seek entertainment. But the things that make us truly human, how we feel, our true intent, and the health and state of our physiology, these are all completely disconnected from the digital world of today. So how do we change this so that technology can enhance our humanity instead of overwhelming it? Well, at Bell Labs, we believe that the networks of the future, what we're calling 6G, will fuse together our physical, digital, and physiological worlds. Ideas, intentions, and feelings will flow freely and instantaneously from one realm to another. 6G will incorporate a massive array of new ultra-sensitive sensors and physiological interfaces that allow us to articulate our desires and actions. And it will create new types of highly personalized body area networks that will safeguard our privacy while allowing these devices and AI systems to connect and interact with each other and the outside world. These changes will be so profound, they will literally augment who we are as humans and how we interact with each other and the world around us. Unobtrusive devices that blend into our environment and adaptable AI that couple our physiology with the digital world 
will give rise to the era of Homo Augmentus. Now, I caution you not to think of this as some prediction of us moving towards becoming techno-cyborgs or the singularity replacing man with machine. Instead, we see a world where the technology that augments us can function on a much subtler level. It can help us avoid an accident in traffic, recall a distant memory, and keep us healthy. The technology of Homo Augmentus will be broadly accessible and unobtrusive, helping people solve everyday problems, manage their work and personal lives, as well as manipulate the environments they live in. We've classified the augmentations of Homo Augmentus into four main categories for how they will change our inner and external cognitive and physical abilities. Today, I'd like to focus on internal physical augmentations, augmentations that will repair, monitor, and enhance the workings of our inner bodies. This technology may one day be able to replace any failing organ, but the greatest impact will be from the devices that provide continuous monitoring of our physiology. These will allow us to detect diseases and intervene become, before they become intractable as well as track and manage epidemics. Unfortunately, this vision of the future is a far cry from the reality of healthcare today. Today, our medicine is almost completely offline and highly centralized. For most people, taking care of their health means going to see a doctor once or twice a year at most, and the bulk of our medicine is almost completely reactionary, only treating you once you are already severely ill. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can start making concrete steps towards the continuous, unobtrusive vision of Homo Augmentus today. So let me switch gears here and tell you about a technology we've been developing at Bell Labs that brings us closer to this future. Recently, there's been a medical diagnostic technique that has been gaining traction in the medical community called Optical Coherence Tomography, or OCT for short. OCT uses light to non-invasively look inside human tissue and reconstruct full three-dimensional views in under a second. It can be used to detect a wide variety of diseases, often very early in the disease progression. In this image, for example, we can see with amazing clarity the back of the eye and retina and are able to see signs of macular edema, which left untreated can lead to total blindness in the patient. This impressive technique is rapidly expanding to other fields such as cardiology, dermatology, and otology. Unfortunately, regardless of the many advantages of OCT, it is still limited to hospital use by its large cost and size. However, the core technologies of OCT are actually very similar to the devices used in modern telecom systems. Devices that, over the last century, Bell Labs helped pioneer to reduce their size and cost. So here I want to show you the world's first battery-powered, truly portable, swept source OCT system. Using integrated photonic technologies originally designed for telecom, we have reduced what used to take up an entire medical cart to a small tabletop box and a handheld scanner the size of a large smartphone. This will allow us to take OCT out of the hospital and to the people who need it most, starting with family doctors doing routine medical exams, and then to outpatients who will be able to use this technology to monitor diseases that would have previously required in-hospital care. But this technology is far more than just hardware integration. The de this device has been designed with a global network in mind, and it leverages that to distribute data processing and visualization between the device and the cloud. This will allow you to give access to a remote doctor who can help you perform scans and then view the full three-dimensional data, such as this scan of skin, instantaneously. The network-enabled design of our OCT allows us to run advanced analytics and AI algorithms in the cloud without running into the severe power and computation restrictions a portable, portable device has. These machine learning algorithms can go through the data layer by layer to look for abnormalities and pull out vital features indicative of our health and mental state, things that previously would have required tedious segmentation by highly skilled workers. By automating this work, we can vastly expand the people who have access to and can benefit from these technologies. 
These AI tools will work hand in hand with doctors to treat us in a truly personalized and proactive way. The monolithic and expensive healthcare system we have today is already starting to change. By leveraging advanced network technologies such as 5G and device innovations such as integrated OCT, we are beginning to move from centralized, cost prohibitive, expert bottlenecked care towards a system that is more distributed, personalized, and AI driven. In the era of Homo Augmentis, these advanced sensor systems, coupled with human centric AI, will transform the way we monitor and maintain our health, allowing us to live simpler, healthier, and more human lives. Thanks, Michael. The next part of today's event is the world first hyper e healthcare 5G demonstration. Thank you, Ashish. Before we show you our Nokia hyper e healthcare demonstration, I'd like to introduce Dr. Prashant Deshpande, who will talk very briefly about a new remote exam device that he invented. This device is also featured in the Nokia demonstration that follows. Current televisit consults provide only two-way audio-video capabilities without sensors, limiting the diagnostic ability of healthcare providers. Our unique, handheld, FDA-approved, and low-cost telemedicine device overcomes these limitations by providing remotely located clinicians the ability to measure vital signs, examine the skin, eyes, throat, ears, and listen to the heart and lung sounds of a patient. The device contains a touchscreen, built-in stethoscope, microphone, camera, and a USB port for connecting peripherals, such as an orthoscope for ear exam. A embedded non-touch thermometer is also part of the system. It has a Wi-Fi capability Bluetooth connectivity for diagnostic tools, and future potential for cellular network connectivity. The device consists of two modes, clinician and soft mode. The clinician mode will be demonstrated in this presentation. This mode is used for a direct provider patient consult. This demonstrates a P2P connection between patient and provider in a HIPAA compliant manner. This slide demonstrates how a parent would use this device. The parent will listen to heart and lung sounds, examine the ears, and transmit the information to the healthcare provider. Consults begin by patient requesting the provider for a televisit. The patient connects their device by clicking the clinician mode. The clinician logs onto their computer to interface with the patient and device. Now we will show the four sensors that can be used for diagnostic purposes. The process begins with a patient summary page displayed to the clinician. A non-touch thermometer is used to take temperature. An orthoscope can be connected for an ear exam. A camera can be used for skin, throat, or an eye exam. A stethoscope will provide for listening to the heart and lung sounds. All these tools allow a provider to make more accurate diagnostic and management decisions for patients compared to telephone or video only consults. Thank you very much. Our Nokia Hyper E Healthcare demonstration highlights key aspects of the Nokia Bell Labs vision. This vision includes sensing, persistent monitoring, with collection of data into secure private personal health records and enhanced virtual visits with a doctor. It does this by featuring a combination of near, mid, and long-term technologies for telehealth. For this demonstration, we have a dashboard for the patient, a web portal for her primary care doctor, 
and a web portal for the medical specialists who will be part of the consultation. Let's start by exploring the patient dashboard. At the top is a calendar to mark all of her healthcare activities. Below the calendar, the patient can see the status of her personal health record data in three areas. She can get more detail by clicking on each of the boxes. Under medical sensors, she can see the data collected from her medical devices, such as blood pressure, heart rate, weight, and temperature. If the values are within normal range, then the status indicator is green. If the values are borderline, then the indicator is yellow. If the values are out of range, then the indicator is red. Under health data, sensors collect information that may impact the patient's health, such as whether she took all of her medication, how much exercise did she get, and how many meals did she eat. Under environmental data, information is collected about her behavior and activity levels, as well as environmental measurements, such as temperature and humidity. Some examples of behavior and activities are, has she been turning on and off her lights? Did she use the microwave? How many times did she open the refrigerator door? An artificial intelligence agent could continuously monitor the patterns of this data to determine early on if there's anything wrong. Today, as you can see on the indicator in the upper right-hand corner of the dashboard, this patient has a reminder alert for a virtual visit with her physician. So let's connect to her primary care doctor now. Looking at the doctor's portal, you can see that the doctor also has access to the patient's personal health records. And directly below the video panel, there are a number of services and functions that the doctor can initiate. After looking at the most recent personal health record data, she will want to start a remote exam with the patient using a remote exam device or what is generically called an Internet of Medical thing. Let's press the Start Exam button to begin. To check the patient's temperature, the doctor asks the patient to bring the temperature sensor on the remote device near her forehead. The doctor then clicks on the temperature button to remotely control the device to get the measurement immediately. Next, let's listen to the patient's heart. The doctor brings up the map of the human body on the remote device and asks the patient to place the stethoscope function of the remote device at the same position as the green dot on the map. Hmm, something doesn't sound quite right. So the doctor checks with the AI assistant at the top of the portal to see if it noticed any possible issues from the data collected since the last visit. Hmm, it looks like the patient's heart problem may have worsened. The AI agent gives a list of possible causes in the order of highest to lowest probabilities, and there's also a referral to a medical specialist to consult with. Before conferencing in the specialist, the primary care doctor should first check to make sure that the patient's insurance will cover this call by clicking on the Verify button. Looks like the insurance is verified. At this point, she can add specialists to this call. The medical specialist portal is very similar to the primary care doctor's portal. He also sees interfaces to the patient's personal health records. But wait, when he clicks on one of the health data boxes, he can't access them. Due to privacy reasons, he doesn't have permission. The primary care doctor then asks the patient for permission by pressing the share patient info button. The patient grants permission with a simple click of the accept button. And now the specialist can see the data. 
After some discussion between the primary care doctor and the consultant, the doctor decides to show the consultant a recent heart scan that was done on the patient. The primary care doctor selects the share screen button and picks the scan under the application tab. Now the primary care doctor wants to direct the specialist's attention to a particular area of the heart. So she picks the draw function and draws a circle on the scan. Notice how the medical specialist is able to see the scan on his screen too. The specialist sees the circle that was drawn and checks that area of the heart. After more discussion, the doctor is ready to finish up this appointment. She uses the right prescription button to order some tests, and she wants to have the patient schedule a follow-up call in a couple of weeks. So she uses a transfer call button to transfer the patient to the scheduler for the clinic. There's one final thing to point out on the doctor's portal. On the left-hand side are additional communication services that the doctor can use. By clicking on these options, she can make voice or video calls to colleagues in her clinic, or she can make voice or video calls to anyone outside the clinic on their regular mobile home or office phone. She can also send and receive text messages from her portal too. The Nokia Vision is of a robust, feature-rich platform that can provide all of the communications and connectivity needs for a comprehensive and holistic telehealth solution using 5G, the web, the internet of medical things, and artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. It is now time for Q&A. Mike, Anne, Michael, and Dr. Deshpande will answer your questions. Padma and Nilesh will read the question. Over to you, Padma and Nilesh. So the first question um, in the, that has been asked is, how can 5G enhance what is already available in e-healthcare today? This is for Mike Kenevi. Okay, uh, so 5G is currently being deployed worldwide as we speak. So, you know, granted Wi-Fi and 4G can enable some of the e-healthcare applications. Um, however, 5G is going to allow a massive amount of health-based IoT devices, uh, you know, massive amounts of data be transferred real time and all that to be processed up in the cloud, you know, without a lot of compute power down at the end, end user. So, you know, we look at things like a use case such as an amb ambulance. You know, today, you know, in, in an ambulance, you know, the, the patient, patient has to wait to, to, you know, they get to the hospital before the doctor's really involved. But things along the lines of remote surgeries are envisioned, you know, as, as a person is in route. So, you know, 5G, I think, is just going to, you know, augment a lot of the capabilities today through, you know, massive amounts of data and low latency and reliability. Do you want to go to the next question? Yeah. So the next question is face-to-face uh, -face human interaction is important for most patient-doctor relationship. How far do you think e-healthcare will go? This, um, Sean, do you want to take this one? Sure. Uh, I think that's a fantastic question. All right. I think because I think many people are, you know, anxious when we start talking about replacing human relationships with machine interactions. But I think there's this fundamental fact that the uh, the limits of, hum of human physicians are just being pushed these days. So I think actually the limits of how far e-healthcare will go is actually quite far especially if we start to build more human systems that start to replicate doctor-like so, capabilities. When am, I, so, when am I getting doing the Dr. Deshpande? Do you want to do Dr. Deshpande next? Yeah. 
So yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think that this is something that I have thought about for the longest period of time in the last 25 years of my medical career. And I think that the device that we have built, such as the one with stethoscope and otoscope, actually gives the patient the feeling of connection Activity when somebody is trying to listen to their hearts and lungs and look at their ears, nose, and throat. And that has been a patient experience uh, which has been told to me many, many times. So I agree with that, that boundaries are, are being pushed. But I think that just rather than visit with a telephone or a, or a uh, visual consult, if somebody is able to listen to the patient, touch the patient in a literal way, I think patients are liking it. So that is my that has been my experience in my practice with the, the device that we have built. So another question that's come our way is you talked about, um, Sean, in your presentation, you talked about a shift in the way we think about building ML AI systems. Why is this shift so important? Why can't we keep building larger versions of the existing systems? Yeah, I think this is an excellent question. It relates to the previous uh, question that I was also answering. Um, as we try to build more human systems, it's very clear that the existing AI systems that we are building or that we built just don't scale. So if we're trying to build systems that are more human-like in their capabilities, systems that allow us to interact with a uh, human being in much the way a doctor uh, would interact with a individual, I think we just need to start to fundamentally rethink the way they're building these systems. It's very clear that the limits of the systems that we're building these days do not get us quite there um, to the level of healthcare or intimacy that we absolutely need if we want to scale these solutions and have them be effective. Okay, thank you. There's a question um, for Dr. Desh Pandey. Uh, Nilesh, do you want to take that one? Sure, I'll take that question. Um, so, Dr. Deshpande, um, you know, the, one of the questions that's co constantly being asked uh, is when you look at this new device that you have um, invented, it, how how would it? Sure. Um, the question is, the question being asked is, how would it take? How is this handle device examination going to be integrated into the? various healthcare institutions. Right, so I think it's important to know that uh, we are we are building uh, APIs and we are building other connectivity interactions uh, so that the healthcare institutions can uh, be connected with our uh, medical device. Uh, the data will go to the cloud and the data will be stored there in a HIPAA compliant manner. And then we'll be able to build up uh, connectivity with various APIs to the medical device with the medical institution software. One of our next goals is to integrate this uh, particular device with uh, EMRs that have been existing, as well as other health, healthcare institution uh, software programs. So that is what we're working on right now as we speak. That's how it will be integrated with healthcare institutions. Okay, that's great. Um, so there's one more uh, one more question that's come up, and this may be for Michael um, about the Homo Augmentus. <laughs> People like that, uh, the presentation and the, um, and the concept. And the question is, what risks do you see associated with this shift? And uh, a follow up on that is how long will we have to wait until we see the era of Homo Augmentus bring, um, that'll bring us to remote and continuous healthcare? Yeah, so I, I think those are, those are both very good questions. Um, so, so on the risks, I mean, they, there's, with any new technology, especially, uh, as big as this that's uh, that comes out there's both te te uh, technological risks as, as well as ethical questions that come up um, i mean being able to network all of these different devices seamlessly together and have them autonomously sense us and enhance us is difficult enough on its own uh, but we need to do it in a way that protects our privacy um, and also using networks that are ultra reliable because uh, one you don't want people stealing all of this information and having access uh, when they shouldn't and you also don't want these networks failing on you uh, when you really need them the most. Um, and so, so those are going to be some of the challenges as, as we build these out on how to do these, uh, you know, to maintain privacy, um, as well as maintaining trust in in the the entities that actually build out these these networks and and uh, and maintain them. 
Now, as far as kind of a time scale on this, I mean, we're, we're already seeing a massive explosion of, of the number of uh, devices that, that sense and augment us. Um, and so really what we see over the next decade or so is, is these new network-based technologies kind of what, from what uh, Anne was showing that can actually take these devices, seamlessly kind of interface them together. Um, that, that's really what's going to be needed to, to push us really towards the era of Homo Augmentus. And uh, as Sean mentioned a couple of times now, really the key here is, is adaptable AI systems that, that can really intelligently connect these things and give us a, a true human experience. Right. Thank you, Michael. Um, there are a few more questions coming in. Um, Elise, you want to take the next one? OK, maybe I'll, I'll ask that okay. question. Um, so a follow up question is Nokia working on other areas of Homo Augmentus outside of healthcare? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're working on a, a couple different areas. We're working on brain machine interfaces um, that will help us. Uh, sure, sure. Really have One of the questions that's coming up about is the privacy and security. Oh. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we're working on brain machine interfaces that really will have us allow us to have much more natural interactions uh, between humans and machines, um, as well as a lot of different sensor types, modalities really that are lacking in the world. Things like an artificial nose that'll allow us to actually remotely sense things that you know we kind of take for granted. The, you know, the smell of cookies or uh, even foul smells. How are the? So if I could just add to that, Michael, as well, just to add another point. You know, there's a fantastic example right now that some of you might have seen in the uh, the news. So right now we've built an end-to-end -end augmenting system for Alex Thompson, who's a sailor who's sailing around the world by himself right now. Um, and so what we built is we built under the project called Augmenting Alex or Sensing Alex, an end-to-end -end sensor network that is giving him constant feedback of sensory data so he can help, help optimize his day. Right now he doesn't sleep a lot. Uh, it's an extremely stressful, turbulent environment when you're trying to sail a sailboat by yourself. So, you know, in terms of trying to augment humans with this technology, we're well along the path uh, of building technologies that are actually affecting people's lives, like Alex Thompson right now, who we hope will win, uh, guided in large part by the vision that we're putting forth for this in healthcare. Okay, great response. Um, so we we are getting many more questions, and as was stated before, um, you know, if you can uh, post those questions, we'll try to get to them after, even after the uh, this um, uh, session is over. So we probably have time for one last question. Um, what about privacy and security of my personal medical records? Will e-healthcare result in information leak? And this may be, Anne, do you want to take that one? Sure, and Padma, that's a great question. Um, as Dr. Prashant Deshpande and also Michael had alluded to, privacy and security of your data is, um, is of the utmost importance uh, to the patient. And we understand that the US government also understands that. Uh, they have HIPAA regulations that, as we talked about earlier, had been temporarily suspended just so we could offer telehealth. Uh, in this time of the pandemic, but we don't expect that to be permanent. Uh, those regulations will come back, um, and our solutions we are uh, will have them available, uh, compliant to these regulations. But I want to also point out that um, there's there's something special that we have um, already with our 5G technology uh, inherently. It provides security. Uh, it provides authentication for the devices and users that uh, get onto the network so that you know that the person or the device that's um, being leveraged for telehealth is who they say they are. Um, and also the data transmission that's the healthcare records will be going over are also secure and encrypted. So you should feel assured that when you're using 5G for telehealth, that it'll be a secure connection that, that you'll be using. And then the rest of it um, in the cloud, um, in our apps, 
will also be secure and compliant to any HIPAA regulations. All right, thank you. That's reassuring. So this this is I think uh, that was probably all the time we had for questions, and we will uh, we have noted down all the rest of the questions that were asked, and we'll try and respond to those at um, later at a later time. Thank you, Mike and Michael and Dr. Deshpande. If you would like to schedule a detailed session with our team, then please contact us or visit Nokia.com. Thank you for joining today's event. We look forward to see you again. Have a great day.